Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where John Krasinski's weekend is off to a very good start. Yes, this is a defining moment in his career, and out of the gate, so far so good, with A Quiet Place posting an amazing 4.3 million Thursday night box office. One of the best ever for the horror genre, as the headlines are saying. Now, I don't know about you, but my first thought was, well, how did it do, right? Well, that did 13.5 million Thursday night. So it's no it, but it is a little bit stronger than Annabelle Creation, which did uh, 4 million. And also uh, recently, uh, Insidious The Lost, The Last Key uh, did like around 2 million Thursday night. So this is certainly strong. Now, Annabelle Creation opened close with again, 4 million on Thursday night. So uh, that went on to do 35 million for the entire weekend. Uh, and just to give you some perspective, Get Out, a film that I compared A Quiet Place to in my uh, non-spoiler review, opened with 33. So this is putting A Quiet Place in the Get Out space in terms of its um, debut box office numbers, which is fair very good. If it can maybe get some awards momentum itself, that would be fantastic for John Krasinski. I'm sure better than he ever hoped to dream. Okay. And it's already overperforming. Uh, going into the weekend, you know, as we said on, uh, as I said on Movie Math on uh, Monday, it was uh, originally thought to do in the high 20s, but just as the weekend started, it was looking a little bit stronger, uh, very high Rotten Tomato score, a lot of buzz. So the industry thought maybe it would hit 30, right? But now I think it could be a couple million above 30. And just how high it goes is going to, you know, kind of be, it's going to correlate with just how much capital John Krasinski is suddenly going to have to spend. Uh, we'll get to John Krasinski more in just a moment, but first I want to point out that this is just a huge win for the horror genre overall. As I said in my review of A Quiet Place, again, this new trend of smart high-end horror picks is very exciting. And the fact, you know, Hollywood loves to copy a winning formula, but they're, they're actually churning out a couple of these. Like, for instance, everyone wants to be the MCU, right? But no one else can. But you're seeing really smart horror picks from a number of different creators, and that's very exciting. Now, as for John Krasinski, what offers will he be fielding after this weekend? I'm sure he and his agent are just so excited. <laughs> now, he's already committed to the Amazon's uh, Jack Ryan show which is going to debut later this, uh, you know, I think late summer. Uh, but he certainly has time to maybe make another small film, right, during his hiatus from that. And we'll see how that goes, although this is going to help that as well. Now, many of you would love to see them be the Fantastic Four. And also, John Krasinski even commented on this. The headline was like, he'd love to be Reed Richards with Emily Blunt. And I thought it was hilarious because when you actually see the discussion that he had, he was like, you know what? I'm not a big comic book fan, was never into him, but I'll take any Marvel character that's left. So if it's, <laughs> it's, it's Reed Richards, it's fine. And you're like, not exactly, you know, it's a, clearly a role you're burning to play there, John, right? I think, you know, I think maybe that's part of the reason he's not in the MCU, right? It's, it's uh, I think... Kevin Feige would like you to have a little bit more compa a passion than that. I also don't think, to be honest with you, that John Krasinski is a good fit with the Reed Richards role. Reed Richards has an intellectual arrogance about him and a distant personality. That's why he and Sue are always having marriage problems and she's always kind of like, do I like Namor? Hmm. Uh, and I think John Krasinski just seems like such a nice guy. I don't think that he's capable of pulling off that role. I know some of you were like, but he's an actor, Grace. Is he? I don't think he's one of those transformative actors. I think he's, you know, um, I'd say a low-key leading man, but he always plays the same role. And he's very good at it. It's a great role. Uh, but, you know, I think TV, I don't know. I think TV is actually a good space for him, but he's already doing it with Jack Ryan. By the way, I don't think Emily Blunt would ever be Sue, um, uh, Sue Richards, I, I, the Invisible Woman. I think it's too small a role for her, considering how strong her career is. I mean, she's freaking Mary Poppins. Uh, she's like, I need to have my own movie if I'm going to have one. Uh, so... I think that he should stay, as for John Krasinski, my advice, what I think he should do is stay a, a multi-hyphenate. I think he should continue to co-write and direct pictures that he appears in. Uh, and I think hopefully he has another gem in mind so that he can strike while Hollywood is, uh, feels he's hot. All right, so that's the first story of the day. Are you seeing A Quiet Place this weekend? I'm seeing it again. I'm very excited. All right, so speaking of opening weekends, Solo, you might have seen, is tracking to open at about 150. That's pretty impressive. Now, of course, that's also a holiday weekend, Memorial Day weekend, but it's 50 million more than Deadpool is tracking at for a debut. So I think that's very interesting indeed. However, as they start to ramp up just slightly the advertising for the film, I have a little bit of a problem with it. For instance, on Twitter the other day, I saw them tweet out, uh, I know, uh, as you know, a line to, to promote the movie. 
And I have a real problem putting uh, uh, Alden Ehrenreich's face next to that line, considering the fact that Ford came up with it, Harrison Ford came up with it. And so uh, another actor benefiting from it, I don't know, it seems a little wrong to me. It's like, don't you have any good lines in this movie that you made? And they're like, no, it's all nostalgia. It's all nostalgia. Uh, and then also one of you pointed out that Denny's is, the, is advertising the Han Solo movie, uh, and that the last high movie of this caliber, like a blockbuster that Denny's promoted was Josh Trank's Fantastic Four. And that's not such a good, uh, you know, uh, correlation there. Uh, there's nothing wrong with Denny's, but you would think that Solo, you know, it, it does seem like an odd match. You would think maybe a movie like Blockers would be advertised at Denny's, and I think quite effectively, to be honest with you. But speaking of cachet, Solo is getting some, and that it will now premiere at the Cannes Film Festival 10 days prior to its release. Now, this was supposed to apparently be a secret, but everyone found out about it. And so this morning, they, Disney released a, a, a press release saying that they would indeed premiere the film at the Cannes Film Festival. Now, to, to me, the first takeaway is that clearly it's not a spoiler heavy movie if it can debut 10 days early at Cannes, where I'm sure nobody there appreciates spoilers, right? So I think. That's one, uh, one thing that's interesting. Also, uh, while the second two prequels premiered at Cannes uh, for, the, for the Star Wars, uh, so far Disney has held all Star Wars premieres in Los Angeles, for the most part of the El Capitan Theater. Now that's their theater that they personally own. It's a nice theater, it's right across from where the Oscars are held. They have a Disney store and a little soda fountain, uh, you know, so you can get an ice cream sundae there. And they not only show like the big, Dis they show all Disney movies, but they also sometimes will show old favorites. And it's a, it's a, it's a nice little uh, experience. I've actually never had the chance to go. I've always wanted to, uh, but I do sometimes check out their website and go, that seems very nice for locals. And that's, of course, because it's free and they want to promote the El Capitan Theater. That's where Disney holds their premieres. But for Solo, they're taking it to Cannes. I'm curious, how are you feeling about the Solo movie as it gets closer to its release? I love the first trailer, you know, the Super Bowl tease and the full trailer that they released the next day so much. But now they're staying so quiet, likely because Infinity War has to come first. Booked awfully close together by Disney, right? Just a month apart. And perhaps... Uh, that's another reason that an Infinity War was moved up because, you know, Solo is locked in competition with Deadpool and Disney's like, we need to give Solo all the help that we can. But we can't be pushing that when, of course, we want people to see Infinity War first. Very interesting. Will you see all three of those movies? I, of course, will. But the question also becomes, which of them will you see multiple times? Because that's how you make a lot of money at the box office with repeat viewings. All right, so speaking of being prolific, uh, the third story of the day is that FX is on fire right now. When I was doing my notes for this video, I was shocked to realize that I watch FX three nights a week, more than any other channel right now. That's amazing. I watch The Americans, I watch Trust, and I watch Legion. And I think they're all pretty darn good shows. Uh, and now they have a new show that they're working on that made some headlines uh, yesterday, and that's they're finally moving ahead with a pilot for Why the Last Man. They haven't greenlit it to become a series just quite yet, but they're going to shoot a pilot. So we'll get casting news, etc., etc. Now, Why the Last Man was a comic book that launched in 2002 under the DC Vertigo imprint by Brian K. Vaughn. And obviously, it's taken forever to get it to, the, to, to any size screen. They were going to make it a movie for a while, then a series. It just hasn't worked out. Uh, Brian K. Vaughn, uh, he started, of course, with Runaways, which has become a Hulu series. Uh, uh, then, Why the Last Man was really the comic that put him on the map. Uh, he's gone to television. It didn't, you know, Under the Dome was a show that he worked on. Uh, his television career hasn't turned out so great. Uh, but his comic book career is on fire as he produces one of the best comics out right now, and many would say the best, and that's, of course, Saga for Image Comics. A show, interestingly, I mean, a comic, interestingly enough, he says, will never be a show. He thinks it's unfilmable, and I say, that thing's unfilmable, Brian K. Vaughn. Uh, so maybe someday we'll be getting, we'll be talking about a Saga show. But as for Why the Last Man, it ran for 60 issues, so it is a finite story. But I feel that it has Walking Dead potential. It's a very, very good comic. If you haven't read Why the Last Man, this is going to take a while, this pilot, so I highly recommend that you check it out. It's extremely good. Now, the story is about a world where all men are mysteriously killed by a virus, except for one, our star, and his monkey. Uh, so he has to figure out, he has not only has to, he's trying to find, um, like, his fiance. Uh, and so he's, you know, he's and also, the, of course, they're trying to figure out what's happening. So that's the story. And then also the government sends an agent to protect him, Agent 355, which is going to be an amazing role for a black actress. Very, very impressive. Uh, what's also interesting about the story, though, is seeing how women adapt to a world with no men. And I think that that might be the thing that finally got this show 
moving forward, finally. And that's the, the age that we live in right now, right? The Handmaid's Tale is so popular. That's kind of a commentary on, uh, you know, Donald Trump winning, you know, winning the election. Uh, and then you have, of course, the Me Too movement. And I think that people feel that why the last man would fit into that conversation perfectly. I do not. I think it's a mistake to think that that's the reason you should greenlight this show. I mean, it's pretty amazing material. I think it would be almost impossible to mess it up. But going too political would be one of the things to do it. I'm also concerned that Michael Green is the showrunner. He's worked on American Gods. He did some heroes work. Green Lantern, Blade Runner 2049. You know, he's a, he's a writer primarily. Murder on the Orient Express. It almost seems like he's the new Akiva Goldsman. Who keeps giving this man work? And then there are some fem there's some female talent behind the camera, um, and they're not particularly impressive. So I'm a little nervous about who's working on this show. But what do you think? Are you, have you read Why the Last Man? Do you think it'll make a good series? And what do you think if it gets too political, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the source material? And if you're not, are you interested in such a show? All right, so now the viewer question comes from Justin Alexander. And Justin says, question Grace, I've always wanted to write a screenplay. What would you recommend as a starting point in terms of beginning the writing process, formatting the story into a typical format, and ultimately putting it into the right hands to be considered for the screen? Love the videos, smiley face. Ah, thank you, Justin. Tough question. Well, the first thing that you need to do is read as many screenplays as you can. Uh, you know, you can easily find them online. You can order them. Drama bookstores will carry them. It's just very important for you to read other people's work and also maybe watch the corresponding movie to see how it turned out. Uh, and read them by the read screenplays by the greats. One person I would point you in the direction of was William Goldman, one of the most famous screenwriters of all time. He has written a number of, not only has he written a number of great screenplays you should read, but he's also written a number of books, not just on how to write a screenplay, but also what it's like to work in the business as a writer. I would suggest you pick those up. Uh, as for writing something, I think that you have to, you know, after you get the, an idea of the, the tone, the pacing, uh, the three act structure, you know, uh, never overwrite your screenplays, never overwrite the, 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 the stage, you know, the, uh, the direction, right? Um, I think what you should do is try and make sure you're telling an original story. Don't do something that's derivative. Don't, you know, don't be like, I love this movie so much, I'm going to tell my own version of the story. That's not going to help you. Uh, and also, I think writing what you know is best, particularly when you're starting out, writing, you know, writing from your own personal experiences. And then as far as getting it into the right hands, you know, also, I could consider a writing program, uh, and as I've talked about before, there are many writing competitions that you can screenwriting competitions that you can su you can submit to, and that's a really good way to get hooked up with um, producers and or talent agents to represent you. There's the blacklist. the The Academy has something called the Nichols Fellowship. I would just you know really do your research and find out the the, the, um, the legit professional avenues. Uh, to moving forward. So good luck, Justin. Uh, you have a lot of great reading ahead of you, I'm sure. Uh, and if anyone else has some suggestions on uh, writing screenplays, of course, be sure to share them in the comments down below. All right, so that's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, write down your thoughts, not only uh, on Justin's viewer question, but also the top three stories, anything you'd like to see covered on Monday, and of course, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.